Being anti-fragile will help you respond positively to the difficulties that come your way in a world full of them. The word fragile had no direct antonyms, so Nassim Nicholas Taleb called its opposite anti-fragile. Anti-fragility is different from resilience or robustness in that resilient objects do not change after a shock. Anti-fragile goods, on the other hand, improve when exposed to shock. For example, Wolf's Law asserts that when bones are exposed to external strain, they become stronger. Anti-fragility is useful when dealing with the unknown since it allows you to accomplish things you don't comprehend. Anti-fragility demonstrates that humans are generally better at acting than contemplating. Taleb divides the earth and all that exists into these three groups. Fragile, anti-fragile, robust. Disorder terrifies fragile individuals because it threatens to destabilize their life. Anti-fragile people become stronger, more innovative, and better in the face of adversity and can adapt to new situations. Robust people can withstand unexpected events without shifting or altering who they are. In this summary, you will discover what anti-fragility is and how to apply it to different aspects of your life, including how to thrive in an unpredictable environment. You may never know what type of person someone is unless they are given opportunities to violate moral or ethical codes. Tilda Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Anti-fragility is a property of anything that experiences more benefits than disadvantages as a result of chance events. If a vulnerable object is sent through the mail, the term fragile is printed all over it to protect the item. It's also true that when we're under stressful situations, we become fragile because we're far more likely to make bad decisions or snap under pressure. We perceive stress as something we should avoid, but it's not always the case. Stress can occasionally become a motivator. It's easy to confuse the opposite of fragile with resilient because resilient things don't change while they're under stress. But Taleb considers anti-fragile to be the opposite of fragile since the thing under pressure improves after being subjected to certain stress. A fragile item like an egg, for example, would shatter if 500 kilograms of weight were placed on it, while something anti-fragile, such as a person, would benefit, getting stronger due to equal stress. Stress may serve as a motivator to help you achieve your objectives. A system that compensates and accumulates additional capacity in preparation for future stress causes anti-fragility. It might be the defining feature of organic versus artificial. Stress may make the human body stronger, but things like cars are resilient, robust, at best since they do not self-repair like the human body. Although anti-fragility has limitations, people respond better to acute stress also known as short-term stress, than the chronic or long-term types. Recovery time enables the body to digest and adjust to the information before new challenges are imposed. Stress isn't something to be fearful of, but you need to approach it with the right mindset to avoid it taking over your entire being. Did you know? According to the American Psychological Association, the most important source of stress for Americans in 2014 was job pressure. When we remove differences to fit into a specific paradigm, we create deeper problems that might bring the system to a halt. In today's environment, we tend to underestimate our need for stress, change, and instability. The story of the Procrustean bed shows how striving to eliminate differences causes greater harm. Procrustes was an innkeeper who would either stretch his short visitors on a rack or chop off the tall one's extremities to ensure his beds were the right fit for them. We do the same thing when we eliminate variations to suit a model. Forcing someone or anything to conform to an artificial scheme or pattern is the source of many issues we confront today. We tend to intervene in situations out of a desire to help, even when doing nothing is frequently the best option. Taleb once submitted an article to the Washington Post but removed it because the Post heavily edited it. He then sent the same article to the Financial Times, which merely changed the dates in the article. His annoyance at the situation caused him to procrastinate, something we all do. Procrastination results from something deep within us that may determine the urgency of a situation, and it can be both beneficial and harmful. We can't hesitate in the face of approaching danger, but we can procrastinate on a task or an assignment. The key to avoiding procrastination is to choose a job where you don't have to battle your instincts or feel compelled to delay. Stop attempting to foresee what will happen and instead allow life to flow. Intelligence, knowledge, insight, talents, and other complex characteristics are less important if you have alternatives. You don't need to be correct all the time. 
All you have to do is avoid doing stupid things to damage yourself and appreciate good things when they happen. Having alternatives will help you profit from the beneficial aspects of uncertainty while avoiding its negative aspects. Touristification is a contemporary phenomenon that treats people like machines, with simpler mechanical reactions and a comprehensive user manual. It is the process of removing uncertainty and unpredictability from things and making them as predictable as possible down to the smallest aspects, all for the benefit of comfort, convenience, and efficiency. It would be a mistake to believe that you can predict where you will be in the future with confidence or that you can know what your preferences will be today and tomorrow. It's naive to believe that others, like you, know where they're headed and could tell you exactly what they want. Never ask people about what they want, where they want to go, where the people believe they should go, or, even worse, what they think is their future need. Steve Jobs, the computer mogul, was known to be a skeptic of market research and focus groups, particularly ones centered around asking people what they want. Instead, he went with his instincts. According to his strategy, People don't truly know what they want until you provide it. Taleb believed people who use too many sophisticated tactics and procedures begin to miss basic things. In the real world, people cannot afford to overlook these details. As humans, we have an innate chance to add to their lives, yet sometimes the greatest answer to our issues is to withdraw. How do you flourish if you have to deal with unstable systems? To begin, you must determine if a system is fragile or anti-fragile. You can do this through a simple experiment. For example, imagine you're in charge of a town's transportation system. First, check to see whether the roads have been over-optimized. You conduct research and determine that when traffic rises by 10,000 automobiles, travel time increases every 10 minutes. However, if 10,000 additional automobiles were added to the mix, travel time would increase by 30 minutes. This type of traffic time acceleration demonstrates traffic's fragility. So, reducing the number of automobiles in the traffic would be more helpful than adding more. This is a good illustration of concavity, defined as the property of being curled inward. Concave systems flourish with removal rather than addition. When presented with many options, eliminating the poor ones will assist in choosing the best decision. Chess masters triumph by not losing. People get wealthy by avoiding bankruptcy. Religions teach a greater emphasis on avoidance and prohibition. Simple precautions can help you reduce your dangers. The biggest addition to knowledge is subtractive epistemology or the act of eliminating what we believe is incorrect. We have a much better understanding of what is wrong than right. Knowledge increases by deduction rather than inclusion because what we conclude today as correct may be incorrect tomorrow, and what we have demonstrated as false today cannot be proven true tomorrow, at least not casually. For example, the statement, all swans are white, is debunked by witnessing a single black swan, yet the statement is not proven true by observing several white swans. Disconfirmation is more comprehensive than confirmation since one event may refute a proposition, whereas a million observations can barely confirm it. Decision-making can therefore be simplified by taking all unnecessary information out of the equation. When it comes to concepts like technology, age is immaterial. The longer a technology exists, the longer it is likely to exist. This, of course, does not apply to every innovation. A pre-Socratic philosopher, Empedocles, was questioned why a dog chose to lie on the same tile every time. He said that the dog and the tile have some resemblance. It is not a result of rationality but rather recurrence. Those innovations that have lasted are like the tile and dog. A match because they strike a chord with something deep within our nature. If there's something in nature that you don't understand, chances are it makes more sense on a deeper level beyond your comprehension. Natural things have much better logic than ours. Their logic is simpler and connects with its true function. Therefore, we should adopt the following rule. What nature does is thorough until shown otherwise. What people, and science, do is defective unless proven otherwise. While we have a wealth of technology and information at our fingertips these days, We are flawed in our approach until we are proven perfect. To understand the outright denial of anti-fragility in the way we seek wealth, consider that construction laborers seem happier with a ham and cheese baguette than businessmen with a Michelin three-star meal. Tilda Nassim Nicholas Taleb. There is no mechanism in place to hold people accountable for their conduct. Hence most people don't have any skin in the game. What does it imply when someone says, skin in the game? 
Having skin in the game is an efficient way to combat vulnerability, but it is still associated with risk. Unfortunately, this method has been abandoned in favor of incentives. Humans have developed a preference for complexity over traditional simplicity. We need to reacquaint ourselves with this solution. Weak people aren't those who don't have opinions. They're those who don't take chances to express them. Dignity is nothing unless you put forth the effort to achieve it and are ready to pay the cost. Heuristics are general guidelines that make things simple and easy to implement. There are two different kinds of heuristics. The first focuses on the imbalance in rewards and punishments or the transfer of fragility between individuals. For example, people who vote for war must have at least one descendant, child or grandchild, who will be exposed to battle, according to Ralph Nader. The Romans were fully aware of this, and they made certain that their engineers spent time beneath the bridges they constructed to demonstrate that they were correctly built. The English even went so far as to invite the engineers' families to spend time with them beneath the completed bridge. This is all connected to the same idea of the transfer of fragility. Every person who expresses an opinion must have a stake in the outcome. The second kind of heuristic stresses the importance of creating redundancy, a margin of safety, avoiding optimization, and minimizing, or even eliminating, risk asymmetry. Corporate executives have incentives without disincentives. But this is something the general public does not fully comprehend. They believe that if executives are appropriately incentivized, they would strive extra hard to avoid failure, forgetting that failure has no consequences. These managers are somehow handed free options by unsuspecting savers and investors. Managers of non-owner operated firms are the focus of this worry, as failure has little to no impact on their well-being. The worst problem of modernity lies in the malignant transfer of fragility and anti-fragility from one party to the other, with one getting the benefits, the other one, unwittingly, getting the harm. Tilda Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Conclusion. The notion of stress being useful is one that we are already familiar with, albeit in limited contexts. On the other hand, we fail to apply this information to other areas of life that require it. To use stress appropriately, we must make a conscious effort to adopt a critical mindset. Life is full of ups and downs, but we may place ourselves to emerge better and stronger no matter what we face. The goal of anti-fragility is to reach a point where nothing can move you. According to the anti-fragile worldview, everything that can't kill you will only make you stronger. We cannot afford to be so delicate in our approach to life that we are terrified of turmoil because there will always be events that drive us to quit or believe that life has no purpose. When problems arise, it's vital to face them head on rather than avoid them out of fear. Instead, adopt the mindset that whatever you face can teach you something and make you stronger and more effective at overcoming future issues. Anti-fragility, which implies overcoming hurdles, should be our response to life's trials. Failure, for example, may lead to poor self-esteem and an inferiority complex. Yet we can learn from our mistakes and work our ways to success. We may even utilize our failures in a certain area of life to educate everyone else on how to improve. There's no need to be pessimistic about stress, challenges, or disappointments. Instead, embrace fragility and choose to be anti-fragile. First, identify the issue, learn from it, then use what you've learned to become a better person. Try this, as a leader. Never separate yourself from the job someone is doing for you. Instead, determine that you are active in learning about the work and have a personal attachment to it. Led by example, your employees or team members need someone to look up to and help them overcome problems. Continue to attend training courses and learn more about your role. You're never too qualified or experienced to learn.